Shalom and uh, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jeffina, John, Paul, and Paul uh, for joining class. We um, begin. Thank you, Zilatoli, for joining class as well. A warm welcome to also our e-learning students who will be joining, uh, listening to these lectures later on. Um, so can I ask um, Jeffina to lead us in prayer, please? Yes, Pastor. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the class we are about to have. God, I just pray that as we are listening to the classes, you will open our spiritual eyes and spiritual ears and spiritual mind to understand your truths that can transform our lives, Jesus, that can uh, bring us to the light, that can uh, make us different out here on this world. God, I just pray that all the truths that our heart will be fully convinced so that we can stand strong for you on this life, Jesus. We give Pastor Selena into your hands. We bless her in the name of Jesus. And I bless all my classmates over here uh, who are about to come, all the e-learning students. We just pray that God, every single truth that we learn, we will apply it in our life and we will live for your glory. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. Uh, so last uh, class on Monday, we looked at uh, Romans chapter uh, 6, I think, 6 onwards till uh, verse 17. So we saw how the Holy Spirit who lives in us is a spirit of life. He quickens uh, life in our mortal bodies. He gives life in our mortal bodies. Um, and we looked at that powerful verse we also see that the Holy Spirit who lives in us is a spirit of adoption. Uh, he makes us attest or he confirms or he affirms to us that we are the children of God and uh, that we are heirs of God and that we are joint heirs of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit, uh, Paul, also reveals that he helps us overcome the law of sin and death, and he is helping us to overcome the sinful deeds of the body. Uh, he is the one who is leading us to become, uh, uh, he's the one who's leading us, sorry, because uh, we are the children of God. Uh, like you know, we said that he is a spirit of adoption, who has uh, who testifies the fact the test the fact that we are part of the kingdom of God now we are part of uh, uh, God's family. Uh, he's also the one who bears a witness regarding this in our spirit man uh, that we are heirs of God and we are joint heirs of Jesus Christ. So. Paul is saying in verse 17 that in the spiritual realm, this is our standing and God wants us to conduct ourselves as hairs of God and joint hairs with uh, Christ. This is our uh, authority. This is our standing in the spiritual realm and we need to exercise that here uh, in the natural realm. Okay, so that is what uh, we looked at uh, very briefly um, you know, about what we learned last class. So we'll continue with um, Romans chapter 8. We will look at verses 18 to verse 23. So can one of you please read Romans 8 verses 18 to 23, please? Romans chapter 8 verses 18 to 23. Uh, Jeffina, just a, a, a request. I hope you don't mind. When you're reading, can you just read a little slowly? <laughs> pause at yeah. commas, you know, full stops, and so that we can all just, you know, get it into our minds and, and our hearts what we are, uh, what you're reading for us. Okay, appreciate you reading. Thank you. But just a small uh, request. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, Pastor. Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 23. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth 
with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirit, even we ourselves grown with us, grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Amen. Good job. Thank you, Jafina. So in this passage, you know, uh, uh, is a very uh, unique uh, passage. It's quite a unique passage because, you know, what Paul is mentioning here, writing here or stating here, he does not share it anywhere else in any other epistles. So it's very important for us to look and study these um, verses. Verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So he says, you know, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time, he's referring to the corruption and the bondage of creation. And he's also pointing out to the future glory. So he says, yes, we are going through earthly suffering. Part of that suffering that he has already mentioned in the preceding verses has to do with crucifying the flesh but he's saying there is something more glorious coming up verse 19 for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of god so he says even creation is eagerly waiting for the unveiling of the sons of god you know we are already sons of god we are already heirs, we are already joint heirs with Christ Jesus. That is already a done, completed thing. But he's saying there is something more that is coming up and even creation is looking forward for that. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, because of him who subjected it in hope. So the him here is a capital H is talking about God. So it says all of creation was subjected to futility, the vain, futile things that are destructive. And it was not the will of God for this to happen. Okay, we need to note here that God did not willingly subject creation to futility because that was not his original plan and design why he created this world. He did not create it, it for it to be perfect for some time and then to be subjected to futility and to you know pain and suffering and all of that it was not his will it was not something that he intended but paul says god allowed creation to be subject to futility to these vain things that are destructive and why did he allow it because this was man's choice okay because man sinned and adam and eve sinned not only did they face the consequence of the sin but all of God's creation also faces or suffers the consequences of uh, man's sin. Okay, so, uh, but God is saying that I'm letting go, I'm letting what I created to be perfect, what I created to be beautiful and good and perfect, I'm letting it, you know, be subjected to futility and to vain things. I'm letting it go because in, in hope, in anticipation of the future hope. That means that he's going to redeem all of those uh, things back to himself, just like he had intended or designed it or purposed it to be. So all of us are redeemed in part. All of us means I'm talking about all of us who are in Christ, who are saved, who are born again. All of us are redeemed in Part, but there will come a time when we will experience full redemption, when our bodies will experience the full uh, redemption. Okay, verse 21, because, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So it says at the future time, creation will also be released from bondage of corruption. But in the present moment, creation now is under bondage of corruption. The great liberty or redemption that the children of God will experience 
when our bodies will be redeemed from being mortal to being immortal. In the same way, you know, we look at this as a future hope and a future redemption when our bodies will be redeemed from being mortal to immortal. Uh, in the same way, creation will also be brought back or creation will also be reinstated to its original position, to its original plan and design that God had ordained it to be. Verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Okay, so creation is going through such a lot of pain. Um, and it says it's like a pain like that of a woman in labor. It is intense pain, but even as there is pain and suffering and bondage and, you know, everything that is going wrong, uh, you know, it will give birth to something. So it is an intense pain, but it's a pain that is expecting something wonderful to happen. Just like a woman, you know, uh, goes through a lot of pain uh, and then when gives birth to the baby, you know, everything what pain that is that the woman has gone through, uh, you know, seems to vanish in the light of, you know, what God has blessed them with, in the light of what, you know, they, she's carrying in her um, arms. So even as they go through this, they go through this intense pain just to know that, hey, after, this pain is not going to last forever. It's not eternal. But I have to go through this pain so that I can see my baby. I can see this beautiful creation that God is being weaving and knitting in my womb. Okay. So not only that, but we who are the first fruits of the Spirit. So he's basically talking of believers in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, says we too are groaning, we too are suffering, and we too are eagerly waiting for the adoption, and we too are e eagerly waiting for the redemption of our bodies. Okay. Now, in verse 21, Paul mentions the glorious liberty of the children of God, and he's referring uh, to the time when our bodies will be redeemed, when our bodies will be fully and completely redeemed. In sense that, you know, as mortal beings, you know, uh, we are redeemed in part, but, you know, there will be a time in the future, an eschatological hope, when mortal will put on immortality. And, you know, when mortal puts on immortality, we will no longer be subject to physical death, to sin, to pain, to suffering, um, but we will experience a glorious redemption uh, in this fullness and all that God has designed us to be. So what is Paul basically telling us in this passage? Okay, He's saying that when Adam sinned, not only did Adam come into subjection to sin and Satan, but the whole world also came to subjection uh, to sin, Satan, and death. All of creation at the fall came into bondage and corruption. It came into subjection to the working of death, which is decay, uh, everything that is bad, that is corrupted. There, is, there was a downward decline, and there was a deviation from God's original plan, design, and purpose. Now, this was not God's original design or how he created the world, but because of sin, the fall brought about corruption. It brought deviation from this original design and purpose and perfect state that God created it to be. Now, why is there suffering in the world today? Because all of creation is under corruption and bondage, and God allowed this subjection because of the future hope of the glorious full redemption. Okay, now we'll just look at a few cross references uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. So, can one of you please read Colossians chapter 1, verse 20, and somebody else can read Coloss Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, please? Colossians 1 20. And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace 
through the blood of his cross. Amen. Thank you, John Paul. So what God is working, what is God working towards? Uh, through Christ, he is going to reconcile all things to himself. He's going to bring it all back. He let it go, not willingly, as we read in Romans chapter 8, verse 20, so that through Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross, he will reconcile all things back to himself. Okay, uh, can one of you please read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, please? Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory? Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. So the Holy Spirit has been given as a deposit and a guarantee until, which means, you know, there is more to come until the redemption of the purchased possession. So we are partly redeemed, but we will be fully redeemed. Now, coming back to Romans chapter 8, verse um, uh, 23, you know, uh, we suffer in this world and we wonder why uh, because all of creation is subject to corruption and decay that is why you know we can fall sick uh, you know, there's different kinds of sicknesses and you know whether we like it or not we can catch a cold a viral fever you know uh, we went through the whole uh, pandemic um, and why because creation is subject to corruption and decay but there is hope uh, the glorious, which what is the hope? This is the glorious liberty of the children of God, the redemption of our body, when God will re redeem all things, you know, back to himself, back to his original plan, position, and design, back to its perfection, to what he will declare as good, okay? Before we move on to verses 24 to 28, anyone has any questions, doubts? Anything that you want me to want to ask? Okay, thank you, Jeffina. Okay, if there are no questions or doubts, we'll move on to verses 24 to 28. So can one of you please read Romans 8, 24 to 28, please, for us? Romans chapter 8 verses 24 to 28 For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we are, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, but he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. So it says, we have this hope, you know, this hope of the redemption of all things, and of all things means creation, um, and also our bodies. But it says that hope that is seen is not hope. You know, we cannot see it. If we, uh, if we see it, there is no need for us to hope for it. But because we cannot see, that is why we have this hope. And hope is something in the future, okay? And all we can do is wait for it in patient endurance, which means wait for it patiently with perseverance, okay? And then, interestingly, Paul, you know, at this time, he transitions to prayer, okay? He says, likewise, he's basically talking about, you know, the whole... Uh, uh, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. So in those lines, he's transitioning into prayer. He says, likewise, in the same way, just like, you know, the Holy Spirit helps us um, 
you know, quickens our mortal, gives life to us, quickens our mortal bodies, uh, just like the Holy Spirit helps us to overcome the law of sin and death. He's helping us to overcome the sinful deeds of the body. He's the one who affirms, attests that, you know, we are the children of uh, God uh, because he's a spirit of adoption. So in the like, likewise, or in the same manner, you know, he's saying the Holy Spirit also helps us in our weakness. Now, what weakness is he talking of? So in the overall context, uh, it's the weakness of our flesh. Uh, and this is the like this is the overarching theme starting from Romans chapter six that Paul has been talking about the weakness of our flesh. But in the immediate preceding context, Paul is talking about the sufferings of the present time that we all are going through. That is the corruption and the decay in creation. Uh, the demonic works that Satan has, uh, that Satan brings suffering and uh, wicked people who plan wicked things against us. And there are times when we go through um, sufferings of life and when we feel weak and we don't want to pray. So whether it is the weakness of the flesh or the journey of the sufferings of life in the present time, you know, uh, we say, God, I don't know what to pray for in this situation. And the same Holy Spirit that, you know, Paul has introduced to us, he says, is the same Holy Spirit that will also help us in our weakness, which means the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. So the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, and what he does, he does with or through us, okay? So it says in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness. Now, the word helps in Greek literally means to take hold of together with us or against. Okay, so to take hold together with us or against. So the Holy Spirit takes hold of us or together with us or against our weaknesses. That is what it means here. Okay, the Holy Spirit takes hold of us or together with us and against our weakness. So it's not the Holy Spirit praying somewhere for us, you know, but he's doing it together with us. He's praying along uh, or together with us, whether it's the weak, weakness of the flesh or the sufferings of the present time, the Holy Spirit takes a hold of us and together with us prays for our weakness for which we do not know what to pray for. And it says, groanings that cannot be uttered, which means the expression is coming from the Holy Spirit. It is actually intercession, but it is coming in the form of groaning that cannot be expressed through speech. And the groaning here is inarticulate speech. It cannot be expressed in tongues, crying and weak weeping whatever sorry it can be expressed in tongues or in crying or weeping or whatever fashion and the holy spirit is releasing it through the life of the believer okay so this groaning is inarticulate speech and it is expressed in tongues crying weeping in whatever way and the holy spirit is releasing it through the believer through the life of the believer. It says in verse 27, he who searches the heart. Now it's coming back to the heart of the individual. So God is looking into the hearts of the individual. Uh, so where is these groanings being released from? It's being released from the heart of the believer. So this prayer, this intercession that helps us in our weakness, it comes from the Holy Spirit. It's released into the heart and the spirit of the believer. And these groanings, which cannot be expressed through our own words, uh, uh, you know, but God looks into our hearts. So it is the Holy Spirit who releases it. It is released into our heart and spirit. And these are groanings which cannot be expressed through our words. And also God looks into our hearts. And it says he knows what the mind of the Spirit is. So God knows what the Holy Spirit is saying because that intercession is the intercession for the saints in accordance with the will of 
God, which means it is perfect intercession. We are praying just as God wants us to pray, or we are praying in accordance with God's will. Okay, so here in this um, verses, who is having the witness? Uh, who is having the weaknesses? It's the saints. It's the believers. Who is helping us in the in prayer? It's the Holy Spirit. How is He helping us? He's helping us by making intercession. And who is doing the intercession? The believer is doing the intercession with the help of the Holy Spirit. And where is the intercession coming from? You know, from the heart of the believer. And who is listening to it? It is God. So it says he looks into the heart of the believer and he knows what the Holy Spirit is saying. He knows the mind of the Spirit. And so this intercession is according to the will of God, which means the believer does not know what to pray for. The Holy Spirit is helping the believer to pray in accordance with the will of God, and it's coming out as groaning, meaning it's a prayer that is coming from the Holy Spirit. It's being expressed in inarticulate speech, and it's not something the believer thinks up or makes up. And the groaning can be expressed in weeping or crying or through tongues. And what is the result? It, the result is that we are praying according to the will of God. And it results in helping the saints in their weaknesses. Okay. So in the light of this, Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose okay so says these are the sufferings in the present time that we are going through but this is our confidence that all things work together for good those who love god and are called according to his purpose so this is our expectation that you know somehow there will be god's purposes being brought about even through the sufferings of the present time that we are going through why? Because we love God, you love God, I love God, and we are called, or I am called, or you are called according to his purpose. So all things are going to work for our good. Okay. So what is this purpose? Verses 29 and 30. Can somebody read that, please? Verses 29 and 30. Somebody like to read Romans 8, 29 and 30, please. For whom he foreknew, he also prayed this time to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, this he also called, whom he called, this he also justified, and whom he justified, this he also glorified. Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. says, for whom God foreknew, it basically is talking about or referring to the omnipotence of God, that he knows all things. So it says, for whom he foreknew, he predestined. He predestined means that he planned before time, which means God knew beforehand, he decided before hand now what did he predestine or pre what did he predestine he did not predestine the choices that we will make okay but he predestined that we will be conformed to the image of his son so now the whole concept of predestination is you know god predestines uh, those who would um, be saved, those who will go to heaven, those who go to hell, and all of those things. You know, God also predestines what choices that we make, so what difference that we uh, does it make for us? No, it's not God who predestines our choices, but He predestines that we will be conformed to the image of His Son. So God knew before time our choices, 
which means we are the ones who will be making the choices in anything and every area of our life. God does not determine our choices. God does not predestine our choices, but he knows beforehand the choices we are going to make. And he predestined not the choice, but he predestined you know, that those who make the right choices or those who believe in Jesus, those will be conformed to the image of the of his son. So he did not predestine some to believe in Jesus, some to accept him, some for heaven and some for hell. No, but he already knew beforehand the choice you and I are going to make. And he predestined that you and I who make the choice to believe in Jesus, to accept him, to receive salvation, will be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So those who make this choice will be uh, made into the image of Jesus Christ because he says he's the firstborn among men, many brethren, that we should be like the brethren of Jesus or we should be just like Jesus. Okay, and verse 30 says, Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, he has also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So all who become like Jesus, they are the ones who become the called. Okay, so the question is, does God only call those he predestines? Or does he call everyone? Or is the invitation for salvation extended to everyone? And those who respond to the invitation are those who are called. Okay. So we need to answer these um, questions. Okay. Now, one school of thought says that God has already predestined things, that which means, like I said, He's already predestined who are going to be saved and you know they are going to be called then if this is true, then there's no need for us to study in a Bible college. There's no need for missions and no need for evangelism. There's no need for us to be busy uh, at church, you know, trying to reach out to the lost souls and give our lives to preaching of the gospel. Because if God has already predestined who are going to be saved, no, let them be saved. They'll automatically automatically have to be saved because God has pre already predestined uh, them to be saved. But this is not what the New Testament tells us. It tells us, you know, the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, that we need to go into all the world, preach the gospel, teach, make disciples of all nations. Okay. So we need to go and preach the gospel to every creation and the invitation is open to all okay john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only son whoever believes in him so the invitation is open to all god loved the whole world so the invitation is open to all anyone can believe and the ones who believe you know uh, says you know john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, you know, shall receive eternal life. Okay. So those who believe will become the called. Okay. And they are the ones whom God foreknew, which means he knew before the foundation of the world who is going to make this choice. Okay. And he says that those God foreknew, he predestined, and whom he called to be predestined. He, uh, uh, and those, you know, who he knew that are going to make this choice, he predestined them to be conformed to the image of his son. And he says those who he predestined to be conformed to the image of the son or those he predestined to be called, he also justified, which means that they would be made righteous. And those he justified, he also glorified, which means that they would become his of God and co heirs or joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Okay, so we need to get this very clear that you know it's not God who predestines our choices. We have been given, we are free moral beings, we're given the, the free gift to choose to make our own choices, but 
God knows beforehand what are the choices that we uh, are going to make. And so those he knows are going to make these choices are predestined, um, you know, to be conformed to the image of his son. And they are the ones who will be uh, made righteous, justified, made righteous. And those he justified, he also glorified, which means that they would become heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. Now Paul wraps up and goes into this whole celebratory uh, proclamation and uh, he's saying here is all that God has done and I'm celebrating everything that God has done in verses 31 to 39. Any questions so far? Any doubts, questions? Okay, if there are no questions and doubts, we'll move on to verses 31 to 39. Can somebody read that, please, for us? Romans 8, 31 to 39. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. When they sh when, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. Good job. Uh, so Paul is putting everything together, all that he has spoken, and then he is, uh, you know, going to shift to an entirely different theme in chapter 9. So here he's putting everything together by asking four questions, and these questions are rhetorical questions. He's, you know, he's asked them in chapter 6, those rhetorical questions which he has done a couple of times in this episode. Uh, and which is something very unique in this book of Romans, ret rhetorical questions, where he asks the questions and he himself gives the answer. Now, why is he asking these questions? Because these questions are questions that will come up in the mind of the people or questions that he would like for, uh, you know, uh, the, or these are questions that he would like for uh, to come up in the uh, mind of people because he wants to summarize the main things that he has been saying so far. So he's asking these uh, questions, he's answering it himself and also he wants it to come up in the mind of his readers or if it comes up in the mind of his readers, you know, they, here are the answers that he can give. So verse 31, he says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So he says, you know, that we know that we are going through all of these sufferings at the present time, and we know that we are facing these hardships. So what is our response to all of this? He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? So he says, you know, he's giving us the first assurance. The other thing is in verse 32, it says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So he says we have this assurance of God's presence that God is for us and that nothing can come against us. And we have this assurance of God's provision. So we have assurance of God's presence. We also have assurance of God's provision that God did not hold back his own son but when he gave his, his son to us, which means he gave everything to us, 
how will he not, along with what he has given us, the best that is his son, how will he not give us everything that we need? So he's saying, while we are going through the sufferings of this present time, and while we are waiting for the adoption of the glorious redemption or the glorious liberty up ahead, you know, while we're going through all of this, we can say God is for me, that God will provide for me. When God gave his son, he will also give us all things and God will provide for you and for me everything that we need and God will be with you and with me. So he's basically assuring us of God's presence and God's provision. So what is a believer's reaction as we go through life? Our reaction should be that God is with me, his presence is there with me, and that he will provide for me. The next question he asks is in verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Now Paul has explained the whole truth of justification and he sums it up with this. He says, look, now God has justified you and me and because he has already justified us, he's made right has made righteous in his eyes, there is no more accusations against us. Okay, we read this in verse 1 of uh, the same chapter, you know, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And verse 34, who is he who condemns us? Or who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. So Paul has already explained to us that Christ died, buried, is resurrected, ascended, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he's saying he's the one who's making intercession for us. So we live with the sense that we are justified, and the one who justified us is the right hand of the Father, and because he's at the right hand of fa the Father, there's no way any condemnation or accusation against us shall prevail. Why? Because even if Satan brings accusations or condemnation. Jesus is saying, Father, you know, the, the lamb that was slain, the lamb that looked like it was slain, is in the middle of the, you know, throne of God, right there in the front of God, uh, front of the throne of God, in the middle, says, I have paid the price. So there is no accusations or no condemnation that can be held against us or prevail against us, okay? We, we also read in John chapter 16 that the Holy Spirit will convict the world and, you know, the ruler of this world has been judged. That means the verdict has already been pronounced and there is no more court case because when Jesus died on the cross, you know, uh, uh, we were not only um, justified, but, you know, God is also the justifier and he also justifies us. So, you know, there is no more accusation or condemnation that can be held against us because the verdict has already been passed because Christ has made the full sufficient sacrifice and is pleased or appeased God and paid for uh, our sin. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Okay, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, Paul says, you know, hope does not disappoint us because the love of God is being poured out into our hearts. Okay, so this hope is consolidated or it's strengthened because God's love is poured out into our hearts. So that's what he says in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. And here it says that, you know, I'm so assured of this love, and that is why I have this hope. And hope has been undergirded by this love that has been poured out into our hearts. So we are confident of this love. Okay. So we are having the looking at the backward look, okay, going back and looking at it. And then he says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or fa famine or nakedness or peril or sword, you know, and he says, there's neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present or things to 
come was the denial, no height, no depth, no anything else in all of creation or any other created thing shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So he's saying whether it's natural things or spiritual things, he says the love of God which is poured out into our hearts, you know, and this love knows that nothing can separate us from this love that God has uh, for us that is poured out in our hearts. And whatever we are going through, you know, he says that we are going to come out as more than conquerors. Which means Paul is saying, you know, we are not just victorious, we are more than victorious. Whatever we are going through in life, we are going to come out as victorious. We are going to come out as more than conquerors. And he's saying nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus that's been poured out into our hearts. And he's saying this is what gives us hope. So this is the summary of uh, you know what he began in chapter 5. So chapter 5, 6, 7, and 8, he just summarizes this whole thing. He says that you know nothing can separate us from God's love that has been poured out into our hearts. And the whole answer for us to overcome the weakness of the flesh, to overcome sin, is the Holy Spirit, is the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Okay, So that is uh, chapter 8, beautiful chapter, powerful chapter. Anything else that, uh, anything, any questions? Any questions? So here basically in this chapter, you know, Paul is addressing some important things for the believer. The Holy Spirit has made us children and joint heirs of God. And so we can have the hope in the midst of suffering in this present time. The Holy Spirit also helps us in our weakness through prayer. It also gives us a glimpse of the glorious hope awaiting all of creation and also for us as children of God. It's also revealing to us, um, this chapter is also a revelation of God's grand eternal purpose for his people and the wonderful assurance that no one can be against us and nothing can separate us from the love that God has for us in Christ Jesus. Okay, any questions? I think in your notes, it's, uh, there is um, how can you apply these truths to overcome sin? Some practical things that you can do. First thing is ask the Holy Spirit to strengthen you to overcome your specific weaknesses. Ask Him to help you. He is our helper, as we read in John chapter 14, verse 26, and John chapter 15, verse 26 as well. Secondly, stay in communion with Him throughout the day. Walk thirdly, thirdly, walk filled with the spirit that is yielded to his influence, uh, you know, being led by him, uh, you know, worshipping him, being thankful to him. Fourth thing is meditate on God's word. God's word cleanses our lives, Psalm 119, verse 9. Resist evil thoughts, temptations by speaking God's word the way Jesus did, uh, like we read in his the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. Pray in tongues, pray often in tongues. Um, submit to God and resist the devil, James chapter 4, verse 7. Resist any unclean spirits uh, by the Holy Spirit, you know, in uh, areas that we are in bondage with. And, um, you know, um, Expel them out of your life from the areas of your soul, which is your affections, your desires, your appetites, your passions. And, um, you know, um, resist the devil and submit to God. Be part of a good local church where you receive sound biblical teaching. Remember that doctrine being delivered to you can set you free, bring about healing, deliverance, and transform you. 
We read, read this in Romans chapter 6, verse 17 to 18. And also uh, the last point, verse 9, get others who are empowered by the Holy Spirit to pray over you to bring deliverance from areas of bondage to sin because we know the anointing breaks the yoke and removes burdens. Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27. Now this is, I think, in your notes, so you can, I'm just reading it out from your notes. Any questions? Any doubts? No, Pastor, we are oh. clear. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's class. Have a blessed, uh, restful, and refreshing weekend, and I'll see you on Monday. Thank you.